Shalom and welcome to another vlog by Danny the Digger and this time completing my series about the quest of ancient Modi'in I'm next to a sign, a promising sign, saying this is a Jewish village from the second temple period by the name of Um El Um Dan Hmm, let's check it out Well first of all, just so you'll understand, we are now at the southern western edge of the modern city of Modin. Actually my house is somewhere up there on the hilltop and this area was exposed on the turn of the 21st century when this neighborhood was being built. Before any modern construction done in Israel you have to conduct salvage excavations by law and surveys and salvage excavations that followed in this region uncovered a very interesting set of finds. So, what have we got here, besides a few detailed signs? I see a mosaic flowing. Indeed. This uh, platform with a white plain mosaic floor and the two little holes, square holes behind it are typical to ancient wine presses. The grapes were placed on this stepping area and people would walk on it again and again adding some of their little in between the toes flavor and the liquid from the smashed grapes would go by gravity through these holes and feeding these trough looking like uh, vats. Okay, some would be containing some local shrubs to add a little special local flavor. And then the product, the produce would be taken for fermentation for the final result. Good made in Holy Land wine. <laughs> And I see here a pomegranate tree whose fruits are way overdue but attesting also to the local produce of this holy land. Now this holy area after being excavated is set as a nice place for a picnic but archaeologically there is very interesting <coughs> stuff up ahead. Let's find my way back to the path. The path of today is following the original path that was found here. Attesting this was not just a set of installation, uh, agricultural installations, but it was a semi-inhabited uh, semi or semi-urban area. Indeed, up ahead I can see some walls, remains of a structure, the owner of the wine press perhaps, or maybe the owner of this wine press. Mm -hmm. There was definitely a lot of wine being grown here, which I have to say is also common in our times. The, the wine coming from this region is among the best in Israel. And this wall attests to some sort of a arranging the environment. Maybe terracing, maybe marking the property, maybe the den. Here is the sign that helps us identify the, the house. It's a dwelling house. It 
those entries from here and of course 2000 and somewhat years later all we see are the foundations here is his neighbor but it gets really interesting spectacular sensational <laughs> at the end of this lane where the 2001 salvage excavations uncovered something extremely significant, extremely important, a find that could relate to the Maccabean revolt. Ready for it? Here we go. So here behind the wall you have a courtyard see here another cistern no set springs around here so you better collect the rainwater when it's raining so you can have water year-round but here collecting the water was perhaps for a very specific religious purpose because here they've uncovered a building with benches around them along the, the walls with bases of columns to support the ceiling there of course is a modern ceiling made by metal and such structures are known from other sites are right, clearly identified as synagogues synagogue from the Greek word suna agogi this is literally a sunagogi, a place to sit together. And in the parallels to such structures like in Masada, we've even found a room with uh, remains of scrolls. Scrolls which were all copies of the Old Testament. If I remember correctly, the, the fragments found in Masada were of Ezekiel and uh, the Book of Psalms. There is no doubt, all scholars agree, that what was discovered here is another synagogue. And while synagogues are not such a rare discovery in the Holy Land, the majority are dated to the Byzantine period, to the Talmudic period, to the time of uh, 4th, 5th, 6th, and 7th century. But there is a dark period, a dark age, in which we just don't see structures that can be identified as synagogues between the suppression of the Jewish revolt and up to the 4th century and then in the time of the temple itself we have a few rare occasions where we find synagogues I mentioned the one in Masada there's another one in Gamla uh, in 2009 they found one in Magdala the hometown of Mary Magdalene and just recently I'm recording this in early 2022 just recently they found another second one in Magdala and this one is about 15% of the corpus okay such synagogues from the first century from the time of Jesus if you wish from the time of the New Testament from the time of the temple are actually quite rare because there was no real need for them like after the destruction of the temple after the temple is destroyed, the synagogues play a major role in Jewish identity and religious practice. They are the places for prayers, for reading the Torah, for preserving Jewish life in the community. Because the main structure and the main activity is gone. The temple, once destroyed by the Romans in year 70, is never built again. So then we see quite a few synagogues. But synagogues in the days of the temple, which are more like community centers well here's one of them one of less than 10 that we know of and proof that this is synagogue beyond the shape of it is also attested by the discovery found here right next to the structure let me lead you to it hopefully without ah falling here we go. What 
is this subterranean site. The plaster on the walls, such as here, and the steps leading inside leave no doubt. This is a mikve. This is a ritual bath. Ritual bath uh, were very common in antiquity. In fact, religious Jews use them to this day. A bride before her wedding, a woman every month, actually. And in the days of the temple, they were used for keeping pure in different conditions. There were actually a lot of rules that required immersing again and again your body in the mikveh. And so there is no doubt that we find a lot of those ritual baths in Jewish towns, especially in Jerusalem. We found so many of them in the Jewish quarter, around the Temple Mount. We found also a lot of those ritual baths in Qumran, the site of the people of the Dead Sea Scrolls, who were also obsessed with purity. And we have quite a lot of ritual baths in Sephoris, which was a major Jewish town after the destruction of the Temple was the town where the Mishnah was codified, a project led by Rabbi Judah the Nasi. But here we have another mikveh just next to the synagogue proving its function. It's a place for assembly and people would purify before going in, before taking out the Torah, and reading it and learning it and preserving and learning and contemplating on the Jewish holy writings. In fact, a new theory suggests that the bunch of stones over here may have been the base for the pedestal or where the scrolls were kept. This theory was recently proposed after the discovery of the stone in Migdal. I hope to record a vlog, a chapter from Migdal as well. I've actually appeared on Eric Stackelback, The Watchman Show, presenting that site. And among others, it's famous for the discovery of a big decorated stone that had all sorts of motifs relating to Judaism. And to this day, there is a debate on what kind of function did this stone have. One possibility, which I follow, is that the scrolls were kept on it or read on it. That's my personal theory. I hope to present it in detail when I go to Migdal. So over here, we have the base of it. Now, here comes the punchline. The date of this, as I said before, is from the time of the temple. The level you are seeing dates to the time of, I don't know, King Herod, first century or so on. But they did find a lower level beneath it. And a level beneath it has to date to the time of the Maccabees. Is this the synagogue where Matityahu and his sons used to read the Torah? Is this the place where they debated and decided and declared, let us rebel against those Greeks, let us break free and form an independent Jewish entity, a rebellion that succeeded. The Maccabees eventually managed to expel the Seleucid Greeks out of Jerusalem and form a kingdom a Jewish independent kingdom that lasted for a century. Is this the site where it all started? Is this ancient Modi'in? Let's go back to the beginning of the video where I said the name, of, the Arabic name of the site is Um El Umdan. Well, in Arabic it literally means the mother of Collins, which doesn't make a lot of sense. But Arabs often gave nicknames to sites whose original name was not clear to them and one could also argue that they call this the mother of columns because in the past one could still see columns where now you only have the bases and indeed 19th century scholars one of them at least did record columns here but I'm asking a different question perhaps perhaps the Arabs called it Um El Umdan because the word Umdan is similar to the original ancient name of the site Modi'in. They simply swap two letters and then Modi'in becomes Umdan. Aha! 
this possibility was definitely presented in the literature, although it makes Modi'in a very, very humble place. I mean, excavations were not carried out around the synagogue to a large extent, but the surveys indicated it wasn't really inhabited. Okay, how do you tell if a site is inhabited by finding items like this? Pottery shards. Let me propose a possible explanation to all of this. Perhaps, perhaps, Modi'in was really spread over quite a long area. An area Fam Khirbeti Torah, at the other end of the modern city of Modi'in, and all the way up to here. I want to remind you also that the name Modi'in in the book of Maccabees does not appear with a N at the end at the ending but with an M and in Hebrew it's an it's a plural ending suggesting that Modi'im may have been actually a cluster of villages and if so then it makes perfectly sense to argue that Modi'in extended from Chirbeti Torah, Givati Torah all the way over here and maybe somewhere also in between now, one key to resolve this riddle, I admit, is by solving the location of the tomb of the Maccabees. But as I've shown in my two previous chapters, it is not an easy task. In fact, to this day, we haven't resolved it. That giant mausoleum with seven pyramids is still hiding somewhere in these hills. Maybe one day you'll hear about the sensational discovery of the tomb of the Maccabees, proving also where Modin Hatika, ancient Modin, really is. Until then, you'll have to follow the research. And frankly, that's a lot of fun. Finding immediate answers is boring. The research, maybe for years, maybe for centuries, until an archaeological mystery is finally resolved. This is what I love about this field. So stay tuned as I might have a breaking news reporting when the famous mausoleum will be uncovered. Until then, I hope you've enjoyed this mini-series. I need to decide what will be the next subject. Perhaps questing after sites mentioned in the New Testament. Following sites that record the biography of John the Baptist and Jesus. That would be quite a challenge. Anyway, until then, thank you all. Oh, of course, don't forget to hit subscribe. Don't forget to like. And if you're in a generous mood, please, I would very much uh, appreciate your little generous contribution to this project, as I'm doing this with very little means. I would really use, for instance, a good wireless audio to have better recordings. Yalla, so long for now.